Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Glad to have you all there. Music stops, you got to find a chair. We, that sounds, so, sounds like something. Hey. And if you've been to a minor league baseball game, you know what they play that on, but that's another whole story. A few announcements to uh, go through with you today. Um, let's just go through. Oh, yes, the first one. It says, Keith forgot to buy a present, so he has rented this space to wish his bride, Nancy, a happy 46th anniversary. <laughs> she need not buy Keith a present since every day is her present to him. And he saved money on dessert because he's coming to coffee hour. You know, it's, it's just... <laughs> like a friend of mine who proposed to his bride skydiving, I said, thanks for setting the bar, you know. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. What else we got? Okay, back to school, Sunday school. Uh, we got Tom Finney playing the role of uh, Sarah, who's away today. So uh, a little prayer for Tom as he kind of leads our, our group there. They're, they're, but Tom knows how to have fun and also loves the Lord deeply, so we're glad of that. Next. We always need volunteers, and, and you, won't, you won't be asked to necessarily lead the whole team, but we do want you to uh, take your part, because raising up the rising generation is the most important thing we can do for our future and for our faithfulness to God. Part of that is our Wednesday night homework club meets 5.30 to 7. We uh, feed the kids as well, but it's an opportunity to love the kids and to give them a peaceful place. So if you know somebody who uh, could use a nice encouraging place to do homework on Wednesdays. We got it for you. Next. Family game night, October 14th, this coming Friday. Pizza provided. Invite your friends. 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Next. We are having um, the Christianity Explored class that was well loved during Lent of this, uh, this previous spring coming up again on the 22nd at 7 p.m. Do we have a video? Not today. Okay. Coming. <laughs> All right. Um, Operation Christmas Child by Samaritan's Purse. Pick up a shoebox in the Fellowship Hall. Um, these are wonderful things, and we are just very glad that uh, we can all be part of that. In order to get these around the, around the globe, we need to get them out early. So uh, get them ready. Returned by the 30th of October. Next. Soup, chili, and chowder. Um, Friday, November 4th, 6 p.m., and we're, we still, I saw there's a nice little sign up of, of folk who are starting to do that. But if you'd like to take part, there's a card table uh, just before you start the, uh, the line of wonders that is our coffee hour. So um, come for that. So that's where you can sign up. Next. And the next day is the country fair, 9 a.m., 3 p.m. Uh, come support, have tea or refreshments, delicious lunch. And uh, Donna, who's some of your team that's working with you on that? Great. Good. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, everybody, for doing that. Next, I think, might be, yes, we've got a gift basket making group going on. Um, just want to temper that also, though, with our small groups that are coming on. We've got to kind of keep those in balance. But if you've got other small groups you're attending some other time, I want to encourage you to do that as well. Go ahead. Handbell Choirs, Monday, 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. We get back and in the evening on Monday, and I see the lights on. Good job. Next. <laughs> Senior choir, Thursdays at 7. We're so glad to have the choir back with us. Thank you, guys, and thank you, Cindy, for that work. Yes, next. Sponsor a dinner. We had one this past Saturday night and uh, last night, and then um, if you can sponsor, please, please help out. See Donna about that. And if you're visiting us for the first time, or if we don't have your information correctly, please do take one of those cards that says, let's connect, fill it out, you can place it in a basket, hand it to one of the smiling faces that uh, greeted you on your way in. And if you're joining us online and we uh, don't have, we're not aware of you, just uh, go to our website and click on the connect tab. And if you are watching, even if you've been watching many times, we, we always love to have a good morning in the comments on Facebook just to know who's out there. We appreciate it and include you as part of our life together. Anything more? 
We need a part-time custodian, 10 hours a week. Frank, who's upstairs, will be able to do it. You'll also be able to see him later as the glowing grandfather of the baby that will be dedicated after the service. That's a special thing coming up. Okay, go ahead. Anything else? Yes, the, it's not only coming this fall, it's here. We've started this uh, faithfully different preaching series. The Grays will, uh, will give us a, a twofer next week with the, uh, both of them will combine in the pulpits to, uh, to, to bring the message. But we've worked together, they and I, to uh, produce a, a, a set of study questions for our small groups. They lead a small group right after church at 11.30 in the parlor. And, and, the, uh, and then there's other groups, and I believe you have in your bulletin a schedule of the uh, other opportunities for that. Men's group is not meeting this Thursday, but will resume next week. Any others? That's it. Great. Well, those are our announcements together. I thank you for your patience. Let's do what our heart yearns for, and that is go to God. Let's come and worship him as the worship team leads us with our opening songs. I've been, uh, as I drive around and see the flaming trees, the orange, the reds, the yellows, I've been just right there giving God a hand clap for how beautiful it is and how it just speaks to me of who he is. And so join me in worshiping this wonderful God. Oh, oh. 
this one's an echo. Mm -hmm. So we sing, then you sing. to worship this morning is Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It, it is, is like, like the precious, precious oil on the, on the head running, running down, down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down over the collar of his robe. It is like dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For their Lord gained his blessings, live forevermore. You know, we, we use the word to christen in situations that aren't church at all. You think about a ship being christened. Well, that's what's being referred to in that call to worship. The oil running down the beard of Aaron, it was an anointing showing God's blessing and God's uh, blessing for a purpose. And so that is our unity, our sharing fellowship together is God's blessing, blessing us for a purpose of being his servants in this world. Part of our way of serving the Lord is our prayers. And I want to thank each of you who, through uh, either talking to me directly or by emails to Jane, in any other way, help us to know about the uh, concerns that are around. And we've, uh, we gather them together, and to get, together we pray, because we know that God promises his blessing on that prayer as we seek to pray according to his will. Please join me. Mighty God, we want to thank you for this day. We thank you for the splendor of New England in the fall. We thank you for the joy of new friends and longtime friends, for your family love that you give us to share and help us always to be open to those new in our midst. We thank you that you trust us with them and pray that we might be a true reflection 
of the person and grace of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, we thank you for today is a special day. We'll be celebrating uh, the dedication of Jerome Amarius Borky, and we pray that you would uh, indeed watch over him all through those days. Lord, we uh, also want to lift to you the many who need your healing touch. For Pete Kavicki, Lord, that he would uh, continue to gain some weight, that, he, that there would be an answer for what the cause of his long-term struggle is. We thank you that Karen Sintafondi has had some good response to chemo, although we, we know there's some pain, God, and pray that that would be relieved. We ask your grace, Lord, upon uh, Cheryl uh, Daniele, who's had a stroke, that uh, the, the healing that needs to happen in order her to, for her to revive from the stroke would happen. We ask your grace to be present in a very special way to Debbie Stewart, who is home being kept comfortable and in hospice. And we ask your, your grace, Lord, on Roberta Newcomb, who was brought to hospital by ambulance this morning with some e uneasiness and pain. Uh, and uh, we pray, Lord, that, that uh, you would uh, help them to find exactly what it is that she needs. Lord, for Jeff Pratt, healing there. For uh, Sonny, dealing with cancer. For Janet, for Janet, who's also had a stroke. For Helen Cookson, recovering from hip um, repair. And uh, Lord, we ask your comfort also on, on, on Pam Heffler, who's home but needs a hip replacement. For Sandy and Bob Wilcox as they journey through the treatment for Sandy's cancer. And Lord, we ask your, your comfort, your grace to be on the family and friends of Mary Heffler, who has passed after time in hospice. And for Lord, many who are past members of this, of this church who have moved or are moving for the Delanos uh, in process now and uh, others who have uh, relocated. Lord, we thank you that you entrust us for a time with people and that no one is ever here forever. And so, Lord, we pray that we might always show the grace that you would bestow on each one who comes, who is our guest here. We thank you, Lord. We pray for our world, for recovery in Florida and in other places devastated by hurricane, for peace in Ukraine, for uh, righteousness among leaders of, of each nation, for a true spirit of public service among all who would seek office and wisdom for those who will elect them. We pray, Lord, for a, a new day of hope and, uh, and better uh, learning environments in our public schools. We ask your blessing and grace upon those who homeschool, those who, who would organize alternatives to schooling as well. And God, there are many among us who have challenges in their lives that are a little hard to put into words. And so we pray that you would attend to each one. And in this brief time of silent prayer, we give you those concerns most dear to our heart. Thank you that you came as the one who will not break the bruised reed. And so we pray your spirit's power to strengthen what remains, to reinvigorate us and give us that great strength that is from you. We join our hearts and our voices and pray as Christ taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Two more announcements before we proceed on. One that we will have... Um, 
uh, we, the Massachusetts Association of Congregational Christian Churches are having their annual meeting this coming Saturday. The information is on an insert in your bulletin. And also, I've been referring to Jerome Amariah's Borky and the dedication. That will happen after the service. You'll be dismissed, and then we invite you to uh, uh, say if you'd like to be part of that. Yes, Mary Lou, you have something to read? Where are you? Do you have it? Uh, c come up, if you would, please. I know. I'm sorry. No, we want to do this because we want folks at home to be able to hear it, too. Yeah, I, I just got the, uh, the loving, holy raspberry of faith there. Okay. <laughs> In a loving Christian way. <laughs> So, so grateful for everything that you do when asked. This is a praying church, this is a giving church, this is a loving church. And no matter what we ask for, it's there. And I just, I thank you for that. This is from Samaritan Church. Even though millions of refugees fled Ukraine at the start of the war, most of the population has remained or tried to return home. About five million people are living close to the front lines in the so-called red zone, places that are vulnerable to artillery fire and missile strikes. Every week, Samaritan's Purse delivers some 75 truckloads of food into Ukraine, and we work with more than 2,000 partner churches to deliver it to those in need. We've already given out 50 million pounds of food most of it in family-sized bags of about 15 to 20 pounds each. We thank God that we have been able to help over 4 million Ukrainians with food, medical care, water, and other emergency needs provided by Samaritan's Purse. Thank you for praying and for giving to make this possible. Winter in Ukraine is bitterly cold and snowy, and war damage will make it worse. Many families and elderly people will be facing the cold weather in houses with bombed out windows and holes ripped in their roofs. Samaritan's Purse is providing clear plastic to seal windows and heavy duty tarps to patch roofs. We are also preparing to purchase and distribute things like blankets, warm hats, and solar powered lights to help them through the long, dark nights. As we continue to respond to the crisis in Ukraine, it's been a privilege to work through the event evangelical churches as they follow the example of God, of the Good Samaritan, and go out of their way to help their neighbors in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Their courage and faith are inspiring. Pastors and Christian volunteers put on helmets and flak jackets and venture into the red zone to bring food and other assistance to residents who have been living under siege. Someday, when this war is over, we want people to remember that, we, that it was the church that cared for them and helped meet their needs in the name of Jesus. This is already evident in one of Ukraine's larger cities, which bore the brunt of Russia's initial siege, but was liberated in May. Churches are busy in the war-scarred streets delivering food from Samaritan's Purse to demonstrate the love of God. There's a great awakening in Ukraine right now, a local pastor told our team. God can turn evil into good. People are turning to God now. Where there is trouble and pain, there is now divine love and care. God is here. No war in the world and no circumstance in life can affect God's love for us. And as a, just a closing note, I don't know if any of you saw it, but yesterday on um, CBS Saturdays, there was a piece on the children going back to school in Ukraine. They can't go back to school unless there is a bunker or, or bomb shelter for them. And I watched, and you know, as my experience as a teacher, I watched these kindergartners go to school for the first time in a basement that looked like a basement. Um, none of the decorations that we spend thousands of dollars on in our classrooms every year. And they, each of them had their book bag with teddies and stuff coming, you know, showing out. And on the other shoulder, they carried a bag in case they were um, forced to stay there because of artillery strike. Um, I sat there and cried. Um, no child, from a four-year-old four to a 104-year-old, should have to suffer. 
that way. Thank you again for your generosity. Thank you. If you think of it, I, I encourage your prayers for a fellow named Jim Sturgill. He uh, trained with me, and he's going on Wednesday. So, um, we have our time now to uh, give thanks to God for his gifts to us, the uh, offerings that you give, for the plate, whether it's in the plate in the back or online at the Donate tab on our website or using the QR code or just mailing it in. Um, if you want to go to something to go to Ukraine, put Ukraine in a memo um, on that, and uh, that'll go. But others, you know, for the ongoing ministries of this church, including our youth ministries, uh, thank you for that. But God promises that the measure we give is the measure that will be returned to us, only pressed down, shaken together, running over. And so we thank him for that, and let's now dedicate our gifts to him in prayer. Lord, whether it's funds we send overseas to help those who are the victims of invasions or natural, natural disaster, or it's funds we place here to enable worship to happen, ministry in your name to happen, uh, outreach. Lord, we thank you that you give to our lives meaningful purpose, that we can be about being forces for good in a world crying out for help. Thank you for your love to us. Help us and all those who receive these gifts to use them well, that your name be honored and your kingdom expand. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. Psalm 15, 1 through 12. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh answer, a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise dispenses knowledge, but the mouth of fools pours out folly. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A fool despises a parent's instruction, but the one who heeds admonition is prudent. In the house of the righteous there is much treasure, but trouble befalls the income of the wicked. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, not so the minds of fools. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. 
The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves the one who pursues righteousness. There is severe discipline for one who forsakes the way, but one who hates a rebuke will die. Shoal and Abdon lie open before the Lord. How much more human hearts? Scoffers do not like to be rebuked. They will not go to the wise. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Cindy. Very nicely done. Let's see. The famous names among the passengers of the Mayflower include 
Governors William Bradford, John Carver, Dr. Samuel Fuller. If I, I may not mention your particular ancestor. It, it, there's a lot of them here. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> not all of us, though. Don't worry. <laughs> Remember, some of my folk met your boat. So. <laughs> Further down the list is one who modeled early what it is necessary in order for diverse people to overcome prejudice and gain friendship. And I speak of Edward Winslow. Bucking the trend of his day, Edward Winslow always spoke highly of the humanity of his Native American neighbors. He particularly developed a friendship with the leader of the Patuxets, Massasoit. And their mutual uh, respect birthed a friendship in the first couple of years of the Pilgrim settlement in Plymouth. Then Massasoit removed himself to Soams, which is in modern day Warren, Rhode Island. But soon Massasoit became seriously ill. Many of you know this story, some don't. Winslow made what was really a seriously long journey to Rhode Island in order to look after his friend. And if you can read fine print, you'll see that it says he found him blind and unable to eat. And with a process that required intimately close contact and real trust between the two men, Winslow cured this man of a very different background, and he really did cement that friendship. And Massasoit showed that their concern for each other was mutual when he warned the, P the Plymouth colonists of a plot against them. <clears throat> but friendships, like all relationships, require effort to maintain, and they're not passed down effortlessly to the next generation. One of the great scars of American history is King Philip's War, which undid the good beginnings between Native Americans and European settlers, and it began centuries of hostility. Sadly, the chief antagonists of that war were Edward Winslow's son, Josiah, and Massasoit's son, Metacomet, who chose to go by the English name Philip. Instead of following their father's examples, they chose to resent and distrust each other. As we continue to look at our modern day cultural divide, so expertly documented in Natasha Crane's important book, Faithfully Different, we need to recognize that one of the great weaknesses of human beings is our tragic propensity to separate into arguing factions. Indeed, left to ourselves, we break off into smaller and smaller groups until our inability to have constructive relationships leaves us utterly alone. Thankfully, God has not left us to ourselves. Few topics show the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures better, more clearly, than their counsel regarding the role of our words in developing mutually caring relationships. And this is important as hostility seems to be ramping up in our country. In today's readings, you'll see that the Bible teaches us, attend to what you will say and you will help heal our land. I'd like you to listen as I read from James, the letter of James, chapter 1, verses 19 to 27. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness strength under control, the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act. They will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, 
to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The wise listen before speaking. In our fallen world, we think the smart people are those who are always spouting off the knowledge they have that they're certain you need to know. And obviously the ones most prone to this fault become pastors so they can talk for 25 minutes without anyone interrupting them. Carol, did you? No, okay. <laughs> the truth is, however, if a pastor doesn't show sensitivity to the concerns and situations of the congregation he or she serves, either the church will fail or that pastor will soon be looking for a new position. Listen before speaking so that when you do speak, you know what you're talking about. And the person you are speaking to wants, you to, wants to hear what you have to say. You will have earned a hearing. We took dance lessons for a while, ballroom dance. We learned that if you want to dance the rumba, the steps are slow, quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, slow. The Bible's lesson for uh, building positive relationships is almost the inverse. It's one quick, two slows, quick, slow, slow. The Apostle James teaches us the steps that lead to building relationships. We are to be quick to listen. That's what we're quick about. Just because you heard something, just because sound waves traveled through the air and hit your ear, doesn't mean your brain received the information. <laughs> Pay attention to the person you're talking to. Put down the newspaper, turn off the TV, take the earbuds out, and look at who's talking to you. I know those are bold concepts. And notice how many ways the trappings of our culture interfere with the true communications that build better relationships. If we will truly love our neighbors, we can begin by listening to them. That values them, doesn't it? Attend to what you will say, and you will help heal our land. We are to be slow to speak. James Fairfield wrote a terrific little book called When You Don't Agree. In it, he points out that we can read, and therefore think, at least four times faster than people speak. The consequence of that? is it's very easy to fall into the practice of formulating our clever response to someone while they are still speaking, which means they haven't finished speaking. It means we're distracted from listening to them. Radical suggestion here. Wait until the person you are speaking with has finished speaking and make sure you understand what they are trying to say and then come up with your thoughtful response. It'll be even more clever. Be slow to speak. And then James says, be slow to anger. This tells us that anger and haste are related. Is there a way, is there a way that what you heard can be understood so as to not cause offense? I was once asked to counsel some friends of each other who had not since fallen out. It seemed that one of them had expressed a struggle he was going through to the other, and this one had said, hey, it's not all about you. Ooh. And both the friends agreed that's exactly the words that were used. I had a hard time seeing that, that there was any other possible meaning than, uh, <laughs> you're not that important, don't bother me. But. I was reminded that the second friend had experienced a stroke at a relatively young age for strokes and had been trying to tell his friend that God was not abandoning him in his predicament. Not only was God with him, but that his friends could also help. What he probably had meant to say, it's not just up to you. You know, others are here to help. So, would have been smart to use better word choices. But if instead of taking offense, the other had banked on the years of friendship they shared and asked for clarification, like, could you say that again? 
their friendship might not have taken such a hit. So, so you know, is there a way that what you heard can be understood so as to not cause offense? Bob read to us from Proverbs 15. Verse 5 said, A fool despises a parent's instruction, but the one who needs admonition, the one who heeds it, is prudent. When my father died when I was 17, it wasn't long before I realized I needed others to fill in that gap. Uncles, some teachers, later professors, my youth pastor. Who has God positioned in your life? to provide you with wisdom. When Solomon writes, a fool despises a parent's instruction, the fool he is referring to, is, the definition is someone who mocks when guilty. You're deflecting away. If we can't admit when we're wrong, we're going to be wrong a lot. How to begin? Listen. We can't heed what we don't hear. By now, you're wondering what this sermon has to do with the book Faithfully Different. Part of being different than the world is being different in how we handle differences with others. There's a terrible model being presented to us. It says that the way to deal with people who present a damaging worldview is to assault and blast them as if to destroy them. Jesus had that opportunity. He had that option, and he taught us that blasting is not the way of Jesus. When Jesus was arrested, he said, I could have called 10,000 angels. He chose the cross. It's totally inconsistent to say we hold a certain set of ethics because they're biblical, and then use interpersonal nuclear war as our means of trying to promote those ethics. And I recognize that we get frustrated when we see those with influence using their power to move people in the wrong direction. Yes, we need to respond. But we must be careful to respond in a manner that is consistent with the ethics we espouse. James 1.20 reminds us that nothing good comes from stirring up anger. Such anger, we are reminded, he says, does not produce the wisdom of God. You've heard me talk about the flaws in our system of obtaining information, that we rely on news and other forms of media, but forget that they may be swayed from telling the objective truth. In a shortcut to obtain what they see as all important ratings or viewership, our media sacrifices understanding. When I was involved in TV production, I was told that if one camera focused on one person for more than five seconds, that was considered dead air. And one had to assume the viewer would move on to another channel, horrors. So content, content has to be exciting in that system. And exciting gets interpreted as incendiary. So we have radio and other personalities who care more about tra- controversy than about truth. The name for them is shock jocks. James warns us not to be stained by the world. When the Bible talks about the world, it's not geological. We're talking about how people behave as a large block. Thus, in response to what we perceive as injustices, the world offers violent protests. That's the system of this world. Tragic acts of police violence are responded to by burning down the shops of the people in your own neighborhood. Any human being can choose that response. But it's just making it worse. As Paul says in Ephesians 4.20, you did not so learn Christ. Jesus would have us speak gently. The one who would not break a bruised reed. He would have us build bridges instead of burn them. I'm so grateful to Pastor David Gray and his teaching us, it's better to say, help me to understand. So we listen. I I remind us earlier of the second great commandment that our Lord gave us. Love your neighbor as 
yourself. And one way we love our neighbors is by helping the society we live in to be as safe, nurturing, and encouraging as possible. One way we live, we help to create such an ideal is by encouraging the rule of law. As someone who'd always lived in pretty safe surroundings, my first trip to Tanzania was very eye-opening. We are in Dar es Salaam, the sprawling capital city. In particular, I learned you do not walk outside at night <clears throat> under any circumstances. If you had to drive at night, you had to be extra careful of pedestrians who might be thrown in front of your car. And if you did hit them, you must not stop, but rather drive directly to the police department nearest to where you were to explain what had happened. Because if you stopped, the mob, which might have caused the death of the pedestrian they threw in front of your car, would beat you and steal your car. Now, that happened in Africa, but it could be anywhere. Because remember, Boston had a neighborhood called the Combat Zone. This illustration, you might find curious, comes from a guide for British tourists telling them where to avoid at all costs. Places where the rule of law did not hold sway, not just overseas. The connection is this, resorting to violence is failing to listen. It's a form of failing to listen. It is insisting on having our own way without concern for our neighbor. Attending to what we say and how we say it is a much better choice. Without common respect for the good of our neighbor, life descends to chaos. Our founding fathers saw this. At the time of its ratification, John Adams warned us that self-seeking, and I quote, will break the cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Laws won't save society by themselves. There must be inner motivation. Our culture is mocking and working against Christian faith to its own detriment. Adams continued, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate to the government of any other. From John Adams to Jonathan Cain, he's famous as having been the keyboardist and songwriter of the band Journey. I did not know until recently that Jonathan's father was a fervent Christian who had always encouraged his son to use his music for the highest purposes. It was his father who told Jonathan not to give up, but instead, and I quote, don't stop believing. When his father died a few years ago, Jonathan was shook to the core. He was trying to figure out how he could go on. That's the work of grief. He said, everything I did, every note I played, I can trace it back to my father. And then God's voice came to me as I sat weeping on the piano. He said, no, John, it's been me. It's me, John. It's been me through your father, but I am the source. I'm where it comes from, John. And Jonathan heard the Lord say to him, you please me. In that moment, he understood that God was the source, the inspiration. And I went, oh man, how did I miss that? So you were the guy in the room when I wrote faithfully. I'm forever yours, Lord, faithfully. Which cites the lyrics to another of his famous songs. He says, it opened my eyes to the transcendence of a father reaching down to his son. Through his natural father, there is this heavenly father, this heavenly voice that came to me, and now I know where it all comes from. That teaches me not to give up on people because they might dress differently than me or like different music than me. God is at work. Let's seek to cooperate with him. I recently completed reading Doris Kern's Good Work, Doris Kern Goodwin's excellent work, Team of Rivals, about the political genius of Abraham Lincoln. The process of holding together such a diverse group of men had been political enemies. They made up his administration. It was good practice for keeping our country from falling apart. And at one point, President Lincoln offered a command to General Benjamin Butler, 
who wasn't sure he could work for the president. He was willing to try. He said, well, I'm a general. I will obey my commander in chief. And he told Lincoln, if you ask me something that goes against my conscience, I will just resign afterward. And Lincoln said, when you see me doing something, anything that for the good of the country ought not to be done, come and tell me and why you think so. And then perhaps you won't need to resign. <laughs> Curious, um, by the way, Butler in 1862 commissioned the first African-American regiment in the United States Armed Forces. There is no doubt that planet Earth is in trouble, the land on which we live. Our expanding population requires we must learn to live neighborly and constructively at the same time. And when we see destructive work, forces at work by means of a pervasive secular worldview, we must not become worldly ourselves in how we respond. Jesus' greatest weapon was the cross. It's what he gives us. Take up your cross and follow him. So we must not seek to rule with loud, angry voices. Listen before speaking. And then speaking with care. That will be the manner that the Lord blesses. Indeed, attend to what you say. You will help to heal our land. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we pray that you will break down the barriers, that we will, none of us in our land, take our identity in political positions, but rather in a humble, bowed position before you, but also knowing that by so doing we become children of heaven's king. So guide us, Lord. Help us to be grace-filled. Help us to be diligent. Help us to look beyond ourselves. Help us, Lord, truly to attend to what we say, that we may be part of your purpose to heal our land. We thank you for the grace shown to us when we did not deserve it. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to close our regular time of worship now with this, uh, this hymn, Rise Up, O Saints of God, which therefore should not be sung sitting. It took you a while. Let's stand. the service. We'll wait about five minutes. Folks, you want to head on out for any purpose at all, you're welcome to. But then we'll proceed with the uh, dedication of uh, baby Jerome. So uh, receive the benediction. Lord, send us forth from this place in the power of your Holy Spirit, your grace upon us, your love for this world as our motivation. 
Your spirit, our strength. Your purpose, our hope. To the honor and glory of Christ, who reigns with you, Heavenly Father, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. to our live stream? Okay, very good. All right. Uh, let me just uh, find my page here. If those who are with us by live stream, we are preparing to continue now with the uh, dedication of Jerome Amariah Sporky, 202.
Skip and Jennifer, who brought their child, Jerome, to be dedicated to God. God is the maker of all things, the giver of life. And in so doing, we follow the way of Jesus, who said, let the little children come to me, for to such belong the kingdom. In presenting Jerome and Mariah to God, do you promise that through the grace given you and in partnership with the congregation, you will teach him the truths and responsibilities of the Christian faith and seek to lead him into a living relationship with Jesus Christ? If so, we will. Do you, the members of this congregation, accept the responsibility together with the parents much as you are able and for the in proxy for the church that they will become part of to teach this child that he may be brought to full maturity in Jesus Christ if so would you signify your acceptance by standing Let us pray. Even as Mary and Joseph brought the child Jesus to your house, Father, that he might be consecrated to your service, so these parents have brought this precious one to your, to this place, that among your people they might present him to you. Give to these present, these parents your special graces of insight and love, that under their guidance Jerome and Mariah may grow in wisdom and stature and in faith with you and all people. Grant that we may truly be a household of faith to Jerome, providing him with food for the spirit to nourish him throughout the years of growth and maturity. And with gratitude for, to you for this child, we dedicate him, his parents, and ourselves to the end that Jerome's life might be a blessing to you and a service to humanity. the uh, congregation. We welcome you and, and thank you for being part of with this. But we also have these gifts, including the certificate of the uh, And so I would encourage you to head to the fellowship hall quickly because otherwise they will be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.